is um, the 13th of November 2013, and um, we have a couple of guests with us tonight. Um, and your last name just slipped my mind. But anyway, Megan, you'll introduce yourself in a second, and um, Andrew Slowinski from wow. DIY.org. <laughs> Um, um, ha have joined us, and uh, we're going to just let them um, jump in and uh, introduce themselves. Chris Lone is here. Uh, Chad Sansing is here. Chad's our favorite player um, in the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we thought this would be a perfect show for him to come, and anytime Chad is available to come, we, we love to have him on anyhow. So, um, and um, and I'm here, and some other people will be joining us as well. Um, I think one of the things you guys wanted us to do was do something called VET, but I don't know what that is. But at least look at, give you feedback on, talk about, give you a chance to talk about some changes you're making on your site at DIY.org. Does that sound right? Megan, yep. since, I, since I didn't look your, your name up here at the last minute, I apologize. Why don't you no. start by introducing yourself? Welcome. Happy to. Thanks. Um, great. Yeah, so my name is Megan Lepla, and I serve as the outreach coordinator at DIY, which uh, means I get to work with some really amazing educators uh, all over the world who are uh, attempting to, to blend DIY into their classroom. And um, yeah, actually just wrapped up a, a really great conversation with a few educators uh, talking about just that. So I'm really eager to, to chat with you folks, too. And you use these Hangouts all the time. We were talking just before the show. Do um, you want to say how, how you do that? It's every yeah. Wednesday? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's pretty casual. So um, hmm. it's every Wednesday you can head over to the DIY Clubs page on Google+, and um, we have the events posted there publicly. But every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, uh, there is a, a DIY classroom-specific hangout where um, teachers get together and you know share best practices, ask questions, and just generally um, having some really great conversation about uh, how how they're using DIY in their classrooms. Cool. Mm -hmm. What was that Google Plus group again? Oh, sorry, it's DIY Clubs. Cool. All right, so thanks. Uh, so a little more about your title, though, Outreach Coordinator. I mean, are you the education coordinator, or, you know, that's, do you uh, outreach to further than education? So, yeah, mm -hmm. so that's actually a great question. Um, mm -hmm. Formally, it's sort of a, a, a loose title, I suppose. It's a, a, I really is club coordinator is uh, my, my main focus. But more recently, we've been realizing that there's some significant differences between the classroom and these clubs that we're attempting to um, to you know, help form and take shape. And so because of that, um, there's uh, been this distinction around uh, this is what a classroom needs versus this is what a club needs. And uh, this is what it looks like when a teacher is using DIY in their classroom versus this is what it looks like when a teacher just totally goes rogue and starts this club, you know, in their, uh, you know, science annex next door and, and just does really cool stuff after school is totally over. So um, it, it's 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 been a lot of fun to, to kind of uh, dig into those differences. Cool. That sounds great. And and I'll, jump, I'll, I'll put this right out there. I'm trying to start a club that's very similar to what you're doing. I'm so far calling it a Hamago club, but cool. maybe, uh, you know, we could do a Hamago DIY club and um, kind of think about what that might look like. Andrew, do yeah. you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm a co-founder of DIY. Um, my role at the at DIY is um, I lead the the design and, and engineering teams. So um, basically, kind of touch the two two pieces of it. Um, before I did that, I started Detroit's first hackerspace and have been working with kids for over ten years. So um, in a variety of different capacities. But Megan and I work really closely together um, to try to figure out. Uh, you know, when we first when we first built DIY, we built it for kids, and we and we sort of uh, we we made a decision very early on to to really focus there and sort of put some of these other use cases to the to the side. Um, one of the biggest of which was teachers. Um, and as DIY has grown, we've we've really learned that that like now we've gotten to the point where we want to make sure that we're addressing the the education community more directly which is really like where my background is and so um, so for for both Megan and I um, this is something that's kind of like near and dear to our hearts so we're trying to spend a lot of time just like 
talking with folks like the people on this call, like um, the folks at the National Writing Project and sort of all over the place um, to try to get a sense for what needs are and sort of how we can do a better job of connecting DIY to classrooms. Andrew, can you tell us a little more of your history? And maybe there's, in that, maybe there's a history of this um, do-it-yourself movement or whatever sure. you would call it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, um, so when in two thousand one, I packed up all my stuff and moved to Detroit. <laughs> um, and uh, and while I was there, um, I got immediately very heavily involved in the Detroit public school system, um, trying to work with them on tutoring, mostly math and writing. Um, and from that, grew out like a, a um, sort of a much larger. Um, project, but one of the biggest things was um, starting an after school, a series of after school programs for underprivileged youth in DIY or in uh, in the city of Detroit, and a lot of that was focused on making. Um, and so, sort of concurrent to that, I started a hacker space for adults, uh, um, and uh, it wasn't until basically DIY that I decided to pack up my stuff and move to San Francisco and sort of focus on taking some of these things around um, uh, project-based learning, passion-based learning, and try to find, try to build a platform or architect a platform um, around it um, that was larger than what I could do on a one-to-one -one basis uh, in Detroit. Um, and so, so you know, somebody on the on the text chat just uh, just asked, mm -hmm. like, what exactly is DIY? So, yeah, I was, I was <laughs> getting there too. <laughs> So DIY. We, we have to talk about things for a long time and then yeah. uh, you know, let people guess what they are. But go yeah, ahead. <laughs> but anyway, so DIY is a community for passion-based learning. So we provide about a hundred different skills that kids can choose from. Um, they do projects to earn those skills, um, and then they uh, they teach each other through. Um, socialization, we provide like a heavily moderated sort of safe social environment for these kids to, to teach each other and to learn from each other um, to sort of build um, build their skills um, and and hopefully lead towards a path of lifelong learning. So um, so our main sort of site is DIY.org and then um, in the iOS app store you can just search for DIY or DIY.org and we'll pop up there as well. And Megan, do you want to come back and try to make some connections between maker spaces and DIY, like or sure, or whatever? Yeah. yeah so, uh, we, we, could you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? So, just oh. curious around, like, the well, I guess maybe maker Andrew spaces? could. Yeah, but I, I mean, Andrew, I mean, you can keep talking, but I jump in and interrupt each other a little bit more. <laughs> the um, is what I'm suggesting. But yeah, Andrew, um, so. So, what is the connection between the makerspace stuff you did and and DIY? So, um, when I first started doing makerspace work and sort of after school workshops and stuff like that, um, the the sort of the maker movement, um, I guess, wasn't really a, a thing yet. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, all we had was just like um, a particular type of instruction that seemed to work well. Mm -hmm. Particularly, it seemed to work well in um, in school districts and in environments where um, students were struggling for a variety of reasons. They were either struggling with engagement, they were struggling due to poor conditions, they were struggling due to lack of resources. Like there was just a whole host of, of different things. Um, and slowly over time I started to find that if if I could actually contextualize the things that these kids were trying that were that they were struggling with so much, whether that was math or whether that was science or whether that was literature, I could start to kind of feel like I was moving the needle as as an outsider. And and so from that, um, you know, got involved with the folks at Make and they they were hugely instructive through well, they've been a huge supporter for a long time, um, so I'd always want to make sure to, to give them the thumbs up. But um, essentially, DIY was sort of spawned out of that, was spawned out of, out of like this desire to bring project-based learning to, to a larger audience of kids um, and to help sort of provide a... a a platform that, that we could kind of build on top of. And so, so when we first started, 
you know, there was like this idea of, well, should we just try to find a way to like make this work straight with the kids or should we make this work with the adults who then like work with the kids in physical spaces? And that's sort of like a false dichotomy, right? Like we need both. Like we need we need kids to have the flexibility to be self-directed, but we also need adults to be heavily um, involved in their lives for a whole variety of reasons. And so um, with that false dichotomy and sort of like a lack of resources when you're a tiny little, you know, three-person company, um, we decided to just focus on kids and figure out a way to um, to, to make it work as, as like what we would call like a, a, a you know, a single user experience. So try to find a way where we could take a bored kid and engage them with something that they might not otherwise do where they might be, you know, spending time um, you know, playing video games or or otherwise, like not not being um, engaged in making and engaged in learning and sort of opening up that community. So we we've done that, and I think we've had some success there. But now it's time for us to kind of to kind of take a step back and be like, okay, that's that's the one half. Now there's time for us to really address the second half, which which really starts with mentors and that's that's not just teachers that's also parents that's adults that's interested you know in in all parts of kids lives so cool and and this is kind of, it's almost like a cyclical conversation it sounds like to me and you're you're jumping way ahead i think a little bit there but I, maybe some other voices chad and chris and paul o is here now and uh, jim as yep. well um uh, jim introduce yourself briefly I'm Jim Chandler. I am consulting teacher in science with the Auburn School Department in Auburn, Maine, and I also run a hands-on learning center called uh, the Auburn Land Lab within the school district, and I have a DIY club and do some DIY activities as part of my school activities. Because I want to circle back a little bit and, and have other people ask the question their way, like what is DIY a little more, um, and, and what is Maker, and what is this all about in general, but also the specific site and specific project you guys are working on. Chad, do you have a way to ask the question? <laughs> or Chris? Well, yeah. So um, I, th I think there are, are two, um, you know, at least two, if not a kajillion kind of ways to think about things. And one is how do you, you know, like the, the outreach work that's being described. Um, you know, I want to I go hang out on these hangouts, and I think that sounds great. And I, I like how DIY.org in particular kind of like grows, it expands. I mean, it's obviously in conversation with uh, its users, both kids and the adults, kind of helping them learn, whether it's at home or, or school or whatever. And so for me, it's like, how do you how do you develop that site? How do you develop that site maybe for a teacherly audience? But at the same time, the question is less like, how does DIY fit into school maybe? And more like, how do organizations like DIY.org help schools be more like them. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to, to jump in on that, Chad. Um, so I should say, prior to my joining DIY, I was actually using DIY as an educator myself. I um, had been teaching art for over five years and uh, found it to be a fantastic portfolio tool, but beyond that, as a really great resource for finding creative projects for my students. And um, What, what so level was that you were teaching? So it was, it was K through 12, but um, you know, so just kind of like many uh, school districts bouncing around as that mobile art teacher for everyone, um, and so it it was uh, you know I didn't I didn't see any challenges around being able to use DIY as an educator. It was something I could hand over to my students and um, just kind of let them do that exploring independently. And of course, I you know I work with so many really uh, fantastic educators who. Who, who do get creative with that, um, in, in spite of lacking a lot of resources that they that they really need. Um, but um, you know, to, to answer to to talk to your point, Chad, about um, DIY sort of uh, being this this supplemental kind of uh, you know not necessarily directly in the classroom, but as as something that's sort of um, you know in addition to. I think that that's something that we're we're seeing a lot of right now. Is just that um, you know this place for kids to go and explore safely, to connect with other kids all over the world, um, and, and to kind of dig into projects independently. So, I think, from yeah. my perspective, two things. is One is that it, it really um, encourages self-empowerment and, and self-directed learners for students, and I really like that aspect of it. The other aspect of it, 
uh, looking at it from a perspective of the next generation science standards is that so much of the old standards was focused on content and and not so much the process whereas DIY is a good place to bring in the process and challenges that are related to applying science knowledge or learning through projects rather than rather than teaching the concept and say oh by the way here's this cookie cutter lab to do that kind of reaffirms the way it's supposed to turn out um, where the, they can uh, really get a chance to dig into a project and then and then I right, have a, have the impetus to say well how does this work how does it you know what's the science behind it rather than the other way around Hey, you know, can I jump in as well and respond? Hi, Paul. To Chad? Hi, you. everyone. Sorry, I'm late. I uh, yeah, we didn't notice hey, everyone. Good to see you all. Um, so I, I just want to say quickly. First of all, I basically uh, always agree with pretty much everything that Chad says. Anything that comes out of Chad's mouth, I feel like is you know the the, the word of God basically for me. Uh, so so with that caveat in mind, and actually now that I've gotten to know. Uh, Jim Chandler as well. I, I, I also hang on his every word, uh, pretty much everyone on, in, on this Hangout. Uh, but the one thing that I would say in terms of uh, the way in which you You've phrase that... Hang. Go ahead. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the way in which Chad phrased that uh, that question, uh, I, I think it, it's, a, it's a lot to um, essentially ask of, a, of an organization, any organization, to say, why can't school be like your organization? Um, because I think that actually there's a you know there's a whole web of organizations that you know are trying to make school like something that I would imagine is your vision, Chad, and that is you know a place where youth have the opportunity to follow their interests and their passions and where they can uh, be producers and not just consumers. All the things that I think are at the heart of DIY. Um, but I would say that and argue that that's true for a lot of different organizations. And I think the, the question really is, in my mind, you know, how can DIY, um, you know, what is the role that DIY can play along with many other organizations in uh, helping to make that a reality in schools? And then I would say, for instance, like, the National Ryan Project has engaged in this Educator Innovator Initiative, of which DIY jumped on, and uh, and you know, and I think that is the idea: is you know, how do we create a coalition? How do we mobilize um, like-minded groups to to make these kinds of changes that I think you know you're intimating? I guess Chris, I had a question oh, about yeah, clubs. Um, you know, I noticed when I I just started looking at your site today. Um, and, you know, there's like this whole network, it would seem, uh, all over the states. And so I guess I'm curious as to how Jim kind of fits in with Andrew and Megan. Um, or do you? Is it really loosely associated, you know? That's a great question. Yeah, so um, Jim can certainly speak to this more. We've uh, been really working on uh, building out those club resources versus classroom resources, as I mentioned earlier. But um, in, in some of the conversations that Jim and I have had, you know, we realize that um, what he's attempting to do truly is fitting into this club formula, which at one point was a very open-ended structure where we were just so excited to be seeing kids coming together in the real world and kind of digging into projects, these, you know, big, great group projects, um, that there, there wasn't much you know, as far as expectations beyond that. And so now to sustain something that, you know, we have over 300 clubs registered globally, uh, we, we have to put together this formula so that we can we can help support a club that's happening, you know, in Auburn, Maine, where Jim is, uh, and make that be something that's uh, part of the same type of community as the club that's happening over in Jakarta, Indonesia, you know, and um, so that that's something that, that can scale more easily. So um, what Jim's doing to to you know to maintain this club identity is that he's supporting kids um, to decide what they're trying to do the kids are leading the conversation they're getting together they're working on projects um, and they're practicing skills that that Jim is supporting but not uh, not driving that that conversation right so um, I'll stop myself from from rambling Jim I you know if you if you wanted to say a little bit more about what it means for for Auburn Land Lab to be a yeah. club I, and, I Jim, kind of, and Jim how old are your how old are your students or what age are you working um, 
the ones that are doing DIY with DIY range from third grade to sixth grade, and I'm just about ready to jump into having a, a gifted and talented high school group be involved with it as well. So I'm starting to, you know, pretty much what I really like is that it's makers at the level of kids. But then it kind of goes up the whole span. There are projects I like to do and are intrigued about that I find in DIY. And so I think it can go the whole range from lower primary or middle primary all the way up to adults. Um, and I kind of straddle, straddle the boundary because I'm not a traditional classroom teacher per se, but I work in a public school setting. So I'm doing a little bit of both. I have a club which allows me to kind of explore all the different ranges of it. Of it. I've also used it in a gifted and talented setting and I've also used it um, to engage um, kids that are getting turned off to education and really um, not dumb the education down but really engage them in a really powerful um, challenge and uh, then from there use that as a jumping point into education. The other part that I'm using it for and haven't quite made the transition yet, I'm in charge of pretty much designing the kindergarten through sixth grade curriculum for our school district, six elementary schools, a middle school, high school, and a couple alternative schools. And with the work moved towards next generation science standards, more and that more of that is uh, involving science practices and and engineering practices. The, as the mode of teaching rather than the end result of teaching. Um, and so I see this as if you have a concept you're teaching, there's that stage in inquiry where you're having kids explore and a challenge is a great place to explore the concepts. But also um, in, in the inquiry model, I use one of the five E's is, is elaboration. And what better way to elaborate than to try to apply it to a real world situation? So a challenge could easily be put into a curriculum piece there as well. Um, and the other piece that we're trying to work on is moving it from teaching through the sage on the stage approach where the, where the teacher's in the middle of the classroom and ex, you know, expounding their knowledge and pouring it into the kids to the point where students are engaged in the topic, they're grappling with the ideas, and the teacher's more of a facilitator and mentor rather than, rather than the dispenser of knowledge. So I see DIY being helpful in all those different settings, from a club setting to a gifted and talent setting to an engagement setting to um, really um, teaching through engineering and science practices rather than the other way around. So, um, Andrew and Megan, I promise you we will get to looking at some of the site and stuff here, but... Um, oh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I really want to. Good. But, yeah, but, and Jim, um, but Jim, could you, uh, sometimes we ask teachers to paint a picture. Could you kind of paint a picture of what it looks like inside either a club class or, or another class with a student doing one of the DIY projects. That so oftentimes... And, and, and actually, could I just jump in and say quickly yeah. that there was a question in the chat that I think yeah, it relates to this, which is, is the thinking that DIY projects would become integrated throughout a school day or more something like a genius hour? So perhaps um, if, Jim, you don't address that, uh, Megan or Andrew could as well. I think it can be both. I think it's easiest right now to start with a club kind of setting. And just let it go. So what's out. that look like, Jim? How um, many kids so are in the room? Do have, they all have computers? Uh, is it a yeah. lab? What, yeah. I have um, 15 students. They're fifth and sixth graders at the moment. They meet once a week, Thursday from three to five. Um, I'll generally work with them and say which which topic area do you want to focus on? And uh, like this last week and th this week, we're going to be doing paper crafts. And uh, so I then, I might have some prompts to say, here are some ways to look at it. Here might be the question for the day. How can you use paper craft? And what materials do you need? Um, I had them doing gliders. I had them doing origami. And another group um, wanted to do cardboard craft. And so I 
sent them to the, the recycling bin. We also have a share center next door, so I've got kind of an unlimited supply of materials. And and I just t told them... See, those details are important. <laughs> pick, yeah, yeah. Pick, pick a topic, pick a, pick a challenge you want. We, we typically all, we generally use um, one iPad to take pictures with, and they all, when they come into the club, they all sign in on, on the, the iPad. But then I try to have enough computers around the class, whether it be iPads or laptops. Sometimes um, we have it in a computer lab. My land lab has enough laptops now that, that we can have them around the room. And they, they sign in. They pick a challenge. If they're just kind of fooling around, I they may... Si they sign in to DIY.org. DIY.org. They check out the, the paper craft, and they and I my job is to kind of see that they're engaged and and be a facilitator, and then also see that they have the materials they need, and then get a chance for them to share what they're doing. Um, when they completed a challenge, I'll help facilitate, take the picture with the with the iPad um, or the movie, and then we we send it to. Uh, um, DIY.org, um, and they can also interact and get feedback from DIY.org on it. And then at the end of the period, I also have journals that they're that I want to have them writing in. So I encourage them to write about what they did, maybe take notes. Um, I had one student that was planning on a whiteboard. I said, well, you should put be putting some of those things in their notebook. So I want to try to have them capture what they're doing in a notebook a notebook format as well, which encourage you using writing in a, a meaningful way. Um, and then I might I might have a short discussion at the end in terms of where did you find the obstacles in doing a project? Um, where did you find more resources? You know, like sometimes um, a challenge might be just a picture of somebody else's um, project, but they may have a, a difficult time getting started. So I might say, well, don't just look at DIY resources. You might look at, you might Google it. You might go to Instructables and say, how do I do a paper sculpture? Because they might show some incredible paper sculpture and the kids don't have an entry level point. Um, and then I could, might show them how I might have found a paper, paper sculpture and got an idea of how it's built up in layers and so forth. And once they've got an idea like that, then they can fork it or go in a different direction um, and apply it that way. So that's kind of how I've done it in a club setting. In a classroom setting, I may pick, uh, and I've also done a vacation camp setting, I might pick a particular project within one of the challenges that it might be a good entry level challenge that I think everyone can accomplish and say, let's all do this in our own way of doing it, you know, so they can, they can create their own variations. And then once they've completed that project, um, they can then go on and off into another direction um, and try a different project. Or maybe by the end of the camp, I may have them picking a project on their own so that I make sure I have all the, all the materials that they need ready to go on the Friday of the camp or something of that sort. What I'm thinking about doing in a classroom setting is we have... Uh, units, and the units have certain concepts to go with it. And, uh, and in fact, I'm involved in a grant through the Maine Math and Science Alliance where we're sp trying to find ways to apply the engineering aspects of next generation science standards to our classroom teaching. And I see in the, the 3E models, the 5E models of, of inquiry, where you start with engagement and then explore and explain and elaboration, but the elaboration might be a really good place to bring in the engineering. Now that you've learned this concept, how could you apply it to, say, making your own musical instrument? Or how can you make musical instruments of different pitches? And how do you apply what you learned in the scientific concepts to that piece of it? Um, and trying to go a little bit beyond it. So that's, that's the varieties. Jim, thanks for those details. That's great. Um, Andrew or Megan, um, anything to add um, that you kind of see other mentors, teachers, club people doing? 
Um, so to, to the point of clubs, uh, you know, I think mm. as I've kind of mentioned, this is something that we're still, you know, so many different formulas and so many different models are, are really kind of falling into place. And uh, one thing that, that I think uh, is, is really fantastic to see happen is when kids from clubs are able to connect with mentors who can um, help them dig deeper into a certain skill set or a certain area. Um, it's fantastic. You know, I'm, I'm so excited that the gym is, is running the, the Auburn Land Lab Club and that he's there supporting the kids in so many different ways. Um, and, and it's great because he's, he's definitely the type of person that, that um, it's, it's uh, you know, he's, he's not just letting them kind of stop it at a, at a surface level, but just kind of saying, well, why do you feel that way, or how could you explore that more deeply? I mean, that's, that's exactly what uh, we, we hope to have happen with clubs. And so in a lot of ways, that is, yes, the club leader, the, the one point of contact, but um, in so many other ways, it's through going on these explorations, getting out in the community, connecting with people in these areas that um, that they may not have known that there's someone who has devoted their entire you know uh, practice to focusing on some certain obscure skill that maybe this kid is really passionate about. Um, so things like that, it's you know it's really exciting when when that happens. Um, certainly in classrooms as well, having those teachers who you know as Jim mentioned also, is just, you know, turning the conversation back onto them rather than dumping the knowledge into their brains. Of course, you know, that's not a reality. <laughs> Saying, you know, turning the conversation over, something I've heard Jim do in the past as well as lots of other teachers using DIY is that there's this idea of, um, Allowing kids to to teach something, you know, like wow, what a what a great what a great concept. But um, with DIY specifically, they've found that you know certain kids or students are are uh, really uh, taking off in a certain skill and becoming sort of masters of that skill. And a teacher will pick up on that and then turn that over to the kids. So uh, you know, maybe there's uh, something within chemistry where they find a certain student is really passionate about or really. Uh, taken to, 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 you know, going beyond what's expected and, and then saying, okay, well, I saw you were doing this project this way or maybe you tried something entirely differently, you know, why don't you share that with everyone? Um, and just allowing for those interactions to happen where the students truly are teaching something to their peers in the class. And does that happen on the site too? Where oh, totally, yeah. A, and, that, yeah. and that's part of the intention of the site? Yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. and so, like, that's one of the, like, I think... Um, you know, one of the things that's really interesting um, when we talk to teachers about or educators how they're using DIY is like one of the critical pieces is like, you know, what happens if DIY doesn't have all the resources? Like we encourage the kid to keep digging. We, we help that, we help facilitate like that, that extension outside of, you know, what's really possible inside. You mean physical the, resources or? Physical or and, resources? and just like knowledge resources, right? Oh, like, oh okay. Yeah. And, um, and that's that's one of like the most important things. Like right now within DIY, if a kid gets stuck, another kid can will oftentimes you know jump in and try to help them. Um, but how does that happen? How do they do that on the site? So kids actually become friends, um, mm -hmm. just like they do on any other social network. Um, and a lot of times the, the the friendships form around shared interests. So um, mm -hmm. you know we we sometimes like laugh about the fact that we have like you know I, clicks is the wrong word, but like little <laughs> sub communities that form on DIY. We have the you know we have the stop motion animation kids. We have the Minecraft kids. We have the dancer kids. We have the farmer kids. We have the blacksmithing kids. I mean, you name it. We have like a little sub community around it. Mm -hmm. um, we even have newspapers that have come up that document all of these various different um, things that the the kids have made as well. And, um, and, and, think, and so, how do you nurture those? Those don't just happen, do they? Or no, maybe? they they don't happen. I mean, you we we do all of us at DIY are responsible for having a voice that's active in the community, and I think um, you know a lot of that comes through. Um, you know, a lot of, of laying the seeds and then letting them grow and knowing when when they're off and running by themselves and then to get the heck out of the way. Um, <laughs> Sounds like teaching to me. Because... Exactly, which is exactly <laughs> the same thing. And so, like, I know it's kind of silly, but... Um, but um, 
and that that you know some of the stuff that, that that Chad was mentioning as well, like on the on the chat, and I think you know there's like a really interesting side conversation going on here too. Well, good. It Let is... us know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I think uh, to some of Chad's questions about like how could how. how you know, how does DIY think about themselves in the context of schools? And that's that's absolutely a fair a fair question. And I think um, you know, uh, I think what Jim is sharing is particularly instructive to us. You know, when when we created DIY, our 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 you know our intent was certainly not to replace schools. Um, our intent was to connect with kids that were that weren't connecting in schools. Um, so this is not like a zero-sum game. This is not trying to convert schools into something that they're not. But one of the things that I think that we do do well, and I think that the makerspace movement and, and lots of other people are trying to kind of crack this nut, and we're all cracking different pieces of it, is, you know, there's there's a general sense of sort of... of um, uh, there's a lack of engagement that's happening with a wide uh, variety of... of of children, particularly in the United States, but um, from our experiences at DIY, this is an international phenomenon. And sort of why is this happening? How is this happening? How are we letting this happen? I think has a lot of different answers to it. But one of the things that I think um, that, that we're trying to, the, the thesis that we're trying to sort of um, build upon is that through allowing um, children to by by returning some sense of self determination to a child, we can we can help um, we can help engage, and I think that that engagement sort of um, that engagement manifests in a lot of different ways. Sometimes it manifests in amazing projects on DIY. Sometimes it manifests in new relationships. Um, forming between kids who thought that they were the only one in their school that liked, you know, some obscure thing like like welding or like, um, you know, being super into journalism or being super into programming. Like, th these are not unique stories. We see them every single day on DIY. And so, and so I don't think that we have some great thing to say, you know what, it, it, schools, you should be more like us. I think that the exact opposite is true. I think that there's a lot that we could learn from schools, but um, I think that the the value that that we're trying to get at and and what we're really trying to cultivate in kids is this is this sense of passion and is this um, is this sense of 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 self determination. So I hope that that tries to address a little bit of what Chad was getting at. And we could go keep going on, but do you want to try to share what you wanted us to give you some feedback on? <laughs> we oh, do have geez. 20 minutes, so let's jump into that. I mean, I I have like 30 other questions to ask you guys, and I hope, <laughs> I hope we continue these conversations. But sure, yeah. Do you want to try to use the uh, the share thing up there? Yeah, the we'll see share? how this works. Okay, um, this will be fun. Uh, all right. <laughs> Let's so, so brief us. Like, how long has DIY.org as a site existed, and are you going through a transition now to add mentors in? I mean, that's basically what you said towards the beginning. Um, yeah, um, yeah. So we've been in existence for about a year and a half. Um, so we're still a really young, small organization. Um, and uh, it's funny to say like that we're trying to redesign or change. Like, because to me, this is just another day at DIY. We're always changing. I mean, we uh, Megan knows, and it drives everybody crazy. Like, we're we're changing something every day. Um, <laughs> we're always improving. Um, and so uh, I think the the groundswell shift for me, is more about um, trying to um, trying to sort of take this, you know, I think I called it earlier like a single user experience and, and make it something that works more broadly in the real world for folks like Jim. Um, mm -hmm. So this is my portfolio on DIY. I'm a moderator. I'm a cat, uh, a nan cat to be specific. <laughs> but um, so for, for those who are tuning in that haven't seen DIY before, um, we have about 100 different skills. Um, we cover everything from, you know, bike mechanic to backyard farming to entomology, ornithology, uh, programming, electronics. I mean, our list has gotten pretty extensive, and we're always adding to it. 
Um, and who and, adds to that list? Um, our in-house team, and that's like the biggest thing that I wanted to talk to you guys about today is um, is when Jim was just talking about the fact that it, that you know he's encouraging his students to go out and find materials outside of DIY. This is this is like incredibly important knowledge. This is knowledge that should that that we would like to see shared broadly with the rest of the community so that everyone can can benefit from. Um, uh, from the sort of like from the depth of experience of you know working with a kid in a physical space trying to build this thing and then realizing you know what I forgot popsicle sticks or you know what I forgot um, you know there's like two steps missing here and here and these are the types of improvements that are really important so um, I probably just chose a bad example skill but this is a rapid prototyper um, you know what I'm going to not use this because this one is fairly complicated <laughs> um, I'm gonna use bike mechanic. Um, when it, when it gets complicated, what 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 makes it hard? Um, well, uh, rapid prototyper is um, is one of our sort of like more out there skills. It like requires a 3D printer um, well, to finish. So there oh yeah go. yeah not necessarily so. Yeah, Andrew, anyway. can you can you pull your screen over a little bit? We can get a little more in maybe. Um, sure. Do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, well, that's good enough. Yeah. Is that okay? Fine, yeah. All right, All right cool. Um, so this is like what a skill at its top level looks like on DIY. So um, this is a bike mechanic. Um, and so you can see I, I have one step towards my bike mechanic patch earned. Um, I restored an old Nishiki uh, a few years ago. Um, so I've got my one step there. I still need to do two more projects to earn the skill, and then after that, I just kind of go out into infinity um, digging in. So here's some of the challenges. Customize your bike, uh, you know, lube your chain, and then they increase in difficulty, ah. so we, we just... Being able to fix your own flat. Wow, that's the biggie. That's yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we like keep going up, and then we get into really crazy stuff. So you know what? Just restore an old bike from scratch. Yeah. You know, yeah. tear down, clean, and reassemble a bike. Build a bike trailer. Um, so for each one of these challenges, we provide a lot of resources um, to um, to to help somebody um, actually complete it. So let's go to build a bike trailer, which is one of the crazier ones. Um, and so one of the biggest things that we do is um, when we're, when we're um, putting together like a challenge, we're, we're providing examples that, that we find or that we create a lot of times. But we're also pulling in examples from the community. So here's a wooden bike trailer that a member of our community built. Um, and so this serves as, as sort of like a, a stakeholder in the ground that shows you know, what's possible for this skill. And kids will jump in here and, you know, comment and say, this is really awesome. How did you make it? Um, you know, just kind of gen general encouragement, I think, is one, of the, is one of the biggest things that the community does. Um, um, but one of the ways in which kids can get inspired by this is they can fork the project. So they can say, you know what, I really like this kid's wooden, uh, you know, bike trailer. I'm going to make my own wooden bike trailer because he inspired me. Um, so they can press fork and then, you know, they jump into, into making their own project. Um, but one of the things that this isn't really good enough, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of data or there's like a, there's a lot of there's a lot of information that's coming from that's coming out of clubs that's coming from the real world quote unquote um, that that we'd like to see um, be able to make its way back into the challenges and back into the skills and and you know this includes like other challenges things that we might not have thought about in our tiny little team um, additional tools addi additional references um, just additional materials, and so one of the things that I wanted to talk about today is um, the idea of opening up um, our skills platform to allow teachers and club leaders and other interested mentors, subject matter experts, anybody, um, to be able to contribute back um, so that we can actually get this kind of out of our little DIY bubble um, and hopefully um, be able to draw on the vast resources um, of the education community. So was that a question or is that a 
<laughs> Are you going to show us what that looks like a little more, Andrew? Or oh, sorry. Uh, where did okay. I go? I jumped back over to here. Um, so there's... We're with um, you. Go ahead. Yeah. Go cool. Ahead. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple different places kind of like where this manifests. Um, let me jump over to... Oh, boy. This is going to be fun. So anybody want to throw a question in while Andrew's jumping around here? Or a thought? Yes, no. We're waiting for you. Well, while Andrew's Sorry. doing that... Uh, Good, one of the Paul. Things, Go ahead, yeah. yeah, one of the things that came to me when Andrew was talking about this notion of engagement or lack thereof in schools, uh, and I'm sure this won't surprise people, but uh, I was at a, uh, a talk once where an educator... Um, asked a group of high school teachers, uh, what do you think the top complaint of your high school students is? And they all said out loud, that school's boring. And, uh, you know, what he said to us was, isn't that remarkable that um, not only that that's true, but that, that actually we know that it's true as educators. <laughs> and, um, and yet school continues to be what it is. So that was just one, one thought that came to me in response to this notion that school is not engaging and how do we make it more so. And the other thing I was just going to say quickly is, you know, one of the reasons why we've been um, so uh, so glad to be collaborating with DIY, you know, we being the National Writing Project, is uh, just because of what um, Andrew said initially, which is this idea that, um, you know, that, and I think it's true that DIY very much um, values you know input from educators and um, and really takes to heart uh, what educators want and need and then uh, works that into uh, you know the, the the daily remaking of the site. Andrew, did you find something else to show us? Thanks. Yeah, I did. So, okay, um, thank you so much. Um, having a little bit of technical difficulties. Sorry about that, but. Um, one of the things that I kind of wanted to show was uh, really, like, the way that we think about skills. So um, your screen share is not there anymore. Oh, whoops. Yeah. All right, let's turn this back on. We don't mind looking at you as you talk, but All right, I just that's wanted good. to let you know we're <laughs> doing this. <laughs> All, right. All right. There you go. There we go. You're back. Okay. All right, so this big colorful map um, that I'm showing here, um, yep. I, think, I think is kind of instructive to the way that we think about skills, but I also think um, this really, I think, illustrates the problem um, that, we're, hmm. that we're trying to reach out to the education community to solve. So this is the way that DIY sees um, its skill taxonomy. Um, so every little hexagon that you see here um, is connected to a different skill that we've either launched or that we actually have in, in progress. So you'll see stuff uh, like Fort Builder here, and then we sort of work out in these six different directions of artist, builder, farmer, scientist, engineer, and hacker. Um, and we're sort of always uh, trying to push further and further towards the outside. So we're starting with the sort of basic and then building pathways out. And... Um, this is, this is like a major problem, because this is a very singular worldview. This is something that, that, that we have sort of developed internally. We've kind of developed all of these internal connections. But we constantly are getting feedback from people that are like, you know what, have you guys thought about a paleontologist skill? Have you, have you thought about, you know, a, uh, a publisher skill? Have you thought about, you know, all of these various different disciplines um, that are so broad and so specific, but also so infinitely interesting. Yeah, like, um, is, is a writer on there, by the way? <laughs> yeah, writer, writer. we just launched uh, uh, just recently see. along with journalists. Um, there you uh, go. Okay, thanks. I see it there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there you go. I see it there. In no small part because of a discussion that I had with Paul and Elise at the National Writing Project, um, you know, like, uh, um, talking about, you know, uh, the feedback from the education community around, you know, not only what is out there and what skills um, folks think are valuable um, in the world more broadly, but also, like, what are kids talking about in terms of what they want to see? And obviously, we have a feedback mechanism internal to DIY where kids can tell us that. Um, but 
Um, the real challenge here is that is that we're trying to to allow kids to follow their passions, and we can't do that if we have this like incredibly myopic worldview. Um, and and so like that necessitates a sort of pluralism. And and right now, um, you know, we're doing a pre pretty poor job at at um, facilitating that. And so so that's that's really what. Um, what we're starting to, to talk about, like what would be an ideal way for a teacher to, to provide that kind of feedback? So I don't see myopic there, so can you, <laughs> anybody else? Um, I mean, I feel a little blind looking at it, but I don't think that's what you meant. <laughs> but so teachers, you want to jump in here? <laughs> Chris or Chad? Any thoughts or questions? Well, it provides a really broad Jim. platform. That's what I like is that there's, there's some place in that matrix that I can find any one of my students. You know, mm -hmm. I had one, one teacher respond back when I was talking about setting up this gifted and talented program for high school students and saying, well, most of my kids are girls and they don't really get into the geeky um, computer um, electronic type projects. And I said, well, there's there's plenty of projects and plenty of different directions to go. Um, and even within those, there are, you know, not to be stereotypical or anything, but there are um, wearable electronics and and uh, they hit the whole range of things. Um, so I think they've done a really good job of, of really expanding our ideas what a maker is, because a maker can go in any number of directions. So that's um, it's even though it might be myopic, it's a pretty broad myopic. <laughs> so, so, can somebody define that word for me, or use another word? I don't quite get it. Like that chart looked looked wild to me. It didn't look so, you know. I mean, so why does it look limited? Or, um, yeah, I think uh, you know maybe I could use like the word narrow or. Um, uh, you know, maybe we're just being too hard on ourselves. That's another possibility yeah, I as think well. That's a possibility. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, what I choose to think is that like there's a universe of skills. It's constantly changing, right? Like there are there are skills today that didn't exist when we launched DIY, right? Um, and and uh, I think in order for us to avoid some of the traps that education can sometimes fall into, which is trying to trying to sort of codify and and put a um, and put a lesson plan around the today and then shoot ourselves in the foot for tomorrow. Um, you know, I really want to build something at DIY that's flexible, that changes over time, that can be adaptive as the world changes. Um, you know, and we still see that. Like, you know, it's it, it. Not a week goes by that somebody doesn't say, "Have you thought about this skill, or have you thought about this project, or have you thought about this challenge?" Um, and that's 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 really valuable for us. Well, I so think how, also how can we contribute? Open, Go ahead, Jim. Go ahead. I think also part of it by opening it up to a wider community is that I don't know how big your staff is, but after a while, it must feel like, oh my gosh, it's it's out of control. We you know, there's so many suggestions come in. There's, there's only you know ten of us and 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 a bazillion things to do. Whereas if you can enlist teachers and club leaders and so forth to help write skills, then all of a sudden it's it's like the World Wide Web. It's all of a sudden pretty soon you've created something that's bigger than the Library of Congress. <laughs> and then you there's a certain danger in that, in that all of a sudden you can kind of lose control of it. But, so, uh, right. But so also, then, from the other from the other perspective, then why do we need DIY if we can just Google? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, mm -hmm. And there was a there was a project that I was trying to pull up um, that's called Visualpedia. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, part of the part of the sort of like original um, intent behind that was like I think every teacher's had that moment where a kid is researching something that's that's kind of difficult and and they you know they're they're doing research online and they hit that horrible black and white terrifying Wikipedia article like that always happens and I think um, you know one of the things that's that can be tricky about about 
the internet and certainly the online space in general is like we have a lot of issues around like privacy, we have issues around safety, but we also just like have issues around building things for with an audience in mind of a kid, right? Like most things on on the internet are not built with that audience in mind. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we try to do is we try to kind of help do some of that sifting, help do some of those the that initial parsing to basically build like what we call internally like trailheads. Um, you know, how do we how do we build a trailhead into neuroscience for a 12 year old? Like these are kind of crazy questions, and I know I know that that sounds as extreme and because it is, but I think that that um, that some of the things that we're seeing on DIY are kind of instructive towards like there are kids that have that level of passion, there are kids that have that level of wanting to to do something that's just wildly outside of the ordinary, and so. So, um, you know, it, it's hard for, it, I don't think that a closed community will ever be able to do that adequately. I think, I think it necessitates openness. Um, but if we can do that openness in a way that communicates directly to kids, if we can do that in a way that's safe, and if we can do that in a way that's private, then, then I think we can, we can help. So what age what age are you generally aiming toward or what age uh, range Is there, 12 year old or? yeah 12 year olds are kind of like our our sort of like core center um okay. but we and how long we, are you allowed to be 12 yeah exactly okay. for 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 <laughs> 6 months um no and no, so we go me. we go all the way up to 18 um but we go well below that as well um okay. so so um, I would say eight to fourteen is really um, the core of our of our user base, though. So I may not be understanding your word myopic, but I, I the metaphor that strikes me as you talk is something about depth um, and mm -hmm. how you go to depth. And 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 as as I've worked with some after school programs and so forth, um, and gotten to this into this dialogue about you know what you guys do in school is boring and what we do is exciting and then my pushback is yeah but you only see them you know so few hours yeah you know right <laughs> and we get we get to go we get to go deeper with kids and and get more quality and and that kind of stuff and that 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 is sort of like a a place that doesn't get anywhere that dialogue but I think we're all trying to get deeper with kids and start with interest. Not all. Let's just say, you know, a lot of us in schools and in after-school programs. So it's that getting deeper that I think you're trying to get to a little bit. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. and I, I, get, I think that's what I meant by myopic. I think I meant it, like, from a vision standpoint where, you know, I can see the near. I can see... I can see the sort of the surface level of all of these skills, right? Like I can, uh -huh. I can probably cover cover the trailhead, but um, going long on a skill, which I think you know, one of the things that's the most exciting to watch on DIY is a kid sort of pan out across a bunch of different skills, trying all of these different things, and then they find the one skill that just makes them go like, oh my gosh, and then they dive in. And I think um, that's where you need school. You know, exactly, school and that's what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's where we need school. That's where we need adults. That's where we need mentors. That's where we really need the community to be able to help these kids keep going and and or to um, give them time to be able to. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, like, some of that happens in, like, you know, face-to-face -face peer mentorship. Like, you know, I myself, as as Megan knows, I have. Uh, and Jim probably knows this too because I think he's been on a couple of our chats. But um, you know, I have like a apprentice at DIY, and I think like you know, um, you know, there's 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 some of these things that 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 any internet service is never going to be able to replace that that human interaction. And I think the the smartest thing. Um, and, and I think like the, the most rational thing, and I think this is trying to get to some of Chad's points, is, is not for us to like ignore that fact or try to gloss over that fact, but rather try to embrace it. Try to say like, you know what, we're, we're doing something that's important and we, should be, and we should be connecting people to the real world. We should be a bridge to school. We should be able to notify the teacher like, hey, you know what, you've got this kid who might not be doing so well in math, but they're an amazing programmer. That's important information. This is stuff that's happening outside of, of the classroom. 
Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, I don't, I know that, that that we haven't shown up with a lot of tangible sort of like this is what this is our roadmap to being here. But I'm actually glad that we kind of get to talk about it a little bit more in the abstract because this is this is you know this is what we're thinking about right now as as a as an organization. No, that's so thank you for that sort of ending. But I'm going to open it up again. So, how can how can we as teachers kind of contribute right now? Do you have a way for us to say? No, here's what we, I mean. You you mentioned at the top of the show the the hangouts that happen an hour before this show does, which on Wednesdays. But are there places where we could throw in? Yeah, Megan, you want to hit that one? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, first first of all, I would say definitely like me. Please, <laughs> I would love to hear from those people. Um, and you know, it's as simple as as sending an email to me. You know, I'm I'm always uh, just. That's great. I, I try to be as communicative as I can and getting back to all those for sure. But also these Hangouts are a great place just to have these open conversations on, on everything we've talked about today. Um, so definitely both of those. Uh, again, you know, we are working towards slowly uh, making a, a space for adults to have their voice on DIY as well. And that's something that is uh, very tricky. And you know, we're, we're very sensitive to maintaining this, this community that is kid-led and, and for kids, but also recognizing, as we've talked about earlier today, it's just that uh, th- there needs to be a place for these awesome mentor, adult, educator type folks to be able to, to chime in and get involved. So uh, unfortunately, the short term is very manual. It's uh, a lot of just hangouts and emails, but uh, those are great. <laughs> um, so definitely that. We do have a forum on DIY as well. It's just a forum.diy.org, and um, that's a great place to, to just kind of put your thoughts out there. And um, another thing that I, I uh, have my finger on the pulse of that as well. So definitely uh, feel free to, to get out there. But, um, you know, my, my email is just megan at diy.org. So uh, please get in touch if, if anyone's interested in, in, you know, has any other questions, is eager to try to, to do something like this in their classroom. I'm so excited to help you with that. So I had a quick question about the kid thing. Um, so, like, how do kids enter the community? Is it, like, through a club leader or through a teacher, or is it just, like, if I'm a 10-year-old, I just want to sign up? <laughs> uh, we have a lot of both. Um, mostly, um, at this point, it's, it's I'm, I'm a 12-year-old, and I see DIY on the App Store, um, or my friend who I go to school with, um, you know, found out about us through word of mouth. And, and so we have a lot of just... It, spreading from kid to kid um, in various different communities. But we also have a lot of kids that are ending in, I would, I would also mention, end in, an increasing amount of kids who are, who are joining the DIY community through um, introduction in clubs and classrooms. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, those, those, you know, that way of sort of joining a community frames things wildly differently. Mm-hmm. Um, and so so we're kind of working on some of the messaging around that, just trying to, like, get kids up to speed in the community um, when they're coming in from both sides. So, um, yeah. So if hey. you have any anybody named Chris from a 10-year-old from Salt Lake City signing up <laughs> soon, you better <laughs> check that one out. You know. That was a hypothetical. <laughs> yeah. I got to um, tell you that when I first signed up, there wasn't any way for an adult, and I, you know. Well, that's uh, a good question. Can adults sign up? Does it matter how old you are? Or what? Yeah. Um, we ask we ask how old ages are, and Jim yeah. has a funny experience because we do um, <laughs> we do we do moderate the community heavily, uh-huh. and uh, mm. Jim well, signed. You'd think, yeah. Yeah, Jim signed up when we first launched, and uh, we caught him and kicked him off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, couldn't keep me away, though. Yeah, exactly. So we, you hey, just have hey, to say who you are and what you're uh, connected with. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Paul, Allison, sure. I just wanted yeah. to also j- jump in and respond to that question of, of how we can help um, we as educators. Mm-hmm. One thing that Megan and I have been talking about is, um, is another Hangout, not necessarily a Hangout on Air, although it could be, but just a Hangout um, in that first week of December. Uh, where we'll talk more about this, and I think the the, the entire focus of the hangout will will simply be, uh, you know, what might educators contribute? You know, how might DIY support educators? 
And so I have not yet reached out to people who want to be in that Hangout, but if anyone here wants to be in that Hangout, just um, shoot Megan so or me. you want to do it here or somewhere else? Or I love that there's so many places it could happen, but yeah, you're welcome so, to come back here. So, yeah, so we could do it here, and, um, you know, however, it was just going to be um, essentially really a very targeted, you know, kind of um, as much as possible focused conversation around, you know, around this um, idea. So, yeah, so we could do a TT. You know, we can figure this out. But yep, um, sounds good to me. But yeah, I would say yeah. if, if anyone who's who's listening or anyone in the chat wants to participate, um, want to make it as open as possible, uh, just shoot Megan or me an email, and then we can figure out the logistics later. And Megan, were you going to say something about that? Oh no, I was just th thank you for bringing that up, Paul. I was going to say yeah, I, I just would love it for teachers to come with their wildest dreams of how <laughs> how they envision DIY, and uh, I just would love to dig into a conversation on that. So cool. So. Chad or Jim, any final thoughts here as we're about to sign up? No, I think it's it's always good to push the push the limits a little bit more and see where we can go. And you know, I'm I'm good, again trying to make that transition of how to get it more in the classroom. So we'll we'll see how that goes. The other part I'll I will mention though is that the other place I've used DIY type activities successfully is a as a as a um, and I'm trying to get my claws into different places in the school district to justify my my existence um, and uh, we've successfully used it as a intervention for special ed special needs students as well um, and uh, it's been a real great motivator for those students and I've had students that have missed lots and lots of classes and and have scribes and are way behind in their classes and and they've come to me after doing a couple of weeks of DIY and they say, you know what I really like about DIY is I get to do it myself and I'm kind of getting tired of having other people write for me or, or, or do things for me and so it's building that, again, that self-directed learner even for a low-level kid, not just an upper-level kid and so that's been, that's been real exciting too. Very cool, Jim. Thanks for adding that. Chad? I it sounds uh, your 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 go, typing go. earlier, but go ahead. Yeah, that's good. No, I was just gonna you know go forth and make. <laughs> go forth and make. Thank hey, you. But so so Chad, though I think you should just. Uh, I mean, I realize that this is a big thing, but you know you have been talking a lot in in the chat um, about this cognitive dissonance. So I think you should at least mention that here in the hangout. Sure. So, um, so. I love Andrew's story. Like Andrew's story, I highly romanticize it as you know, someone who's gone, worked in schools, reading and math, heavily uh, scrutinized and standardized area. Obviously, teaching in a place where it's very tough to kind of gain some traction with what you want to do, and then finding a place to go, a thing to build that is a great educational platform and really hits the high notes of inquiry, passion making. Uh, but, and then we have other, you know, and that that narrative to me is in contrast to what schools are doing. When we talk about kids being bored or a lack of engagement, I'm pretty sure there's some systemic things that are, you know, like built to do that and that they target <laughs> different populations in different places quite purposely. Um, and so when we get to the part about connecting with educators, I totally grok it. When we get to the part about connecting with schools, um, I don't know, I just want to unpack more and, and ask non-rhetorical questions that sound rhetorical, but really dig into, you know, what are, you know, I don't know, what are the, ways to, the best ways to do this stuff uh, for kids and looking at the possibility that school can be it in some places and might not be it in others and what does that mean for everybody, not just for one organization or one group to like fix things, but what does that suggest as possible theories of practice later on? Very cool. Oh, Anna, <laughs> as we're signing off, but that's okay. Anna, do you want to say hi? <laughs> hi, Anna. Hi. Hey, Anna. <laughs> I can. I, I'll just find you guys and ask my question later. <laughs> no, no, jump in. I just got home. What, what'd you want to say? Go ahead. Oh, I was just wondering. Um, I'm just trying to do, to do some redesign of um, the program that I work with with youth, and so it's kind of a hybrid out of school in school kind of space. So I was wondering about how um, DIY.org and um, some of these other, you know, 
predominantly out of out of school realm kind of spaces, alternative spaces. Um, are you making any? Do you have any ideas about interfacing with schools um, and about how that is playing out? Like, did you guys talk about that? <laughs> did I miss it? It sounds like a great. Uh, you want to come back early December and we'll talk about this? <laughs> uh, no, I'm serious. That sounds like a, a good way to 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 throw this out. And 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 I do think Youth Voices is one you know one way that we can start playing with some of that too because that's. That has been an in-school thing, but uh, the more we can connect with out-school, out-of-school interests, the better we are too. Uh -huh. So, yeah, yeah. So, sounds good. <laughs> but yeah, so let's plan that early December, and uh, we'll get all get back together. Um, we, uh, I think, I, because um, we'll talk, but I think we will not be here next week because I'm going to be uh, going to Boston, NCTE, and and so forth. Um, and, and, uh, but we'll be back a Wednesday very soon, um, because we're here almost every Wednesday at edtechtalk.com slash TTT, and, uh, that was, uh, created, built, um, uh, a little while ago by Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo, um, as part of the, uh, World Bridges Network. Thank you all, and, uh, we'll see you again soon. Anna, thank you for that <laughs> last little push there. <laughs> I just walked in the door, literally. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> hey, and Anna, so, Anna, send me an email about this because seriously, we are going to be getting back together in December to talk. So okay. you know, we want to. Yeah, it sounds together. like a, a, a nice hook to, to do this. Okay, and, and Paul, I need to talk to you about youth voices too, and, and using yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, so okay. I'll email both good. of you. <laughs> good idea. Stay connected. See y'all. Thanks. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Thanks. I'll email.